Uh, so I'd like to welcome everyone here this afternoon. Most of you traveled from, from Bangkok, quite a long way. Um, <clears throat> uh, what I plan to do is to uh, give a general introductory talk for maybe 40-45 minutes, um, after which there will be a short break just to stretch your legs and then we'll have a, a meditation session for about half an hour and after that um, um, we'll have a questions and answers session. Um, as um, I think many of you are, uh, are very new or quite new uh, to Buddhism and, and some of you uh, already have a fair amount of experience, um, then I'm sure the questions will be, uh, interests will be quite varied. So to try to cover everything as well as I can in the short time we have, um, I think the questions and answer session is probably the best way to do that. And um, planning to finish at 3.30, um, but I'm, uh, I'm still available after that if anybody wants to stay on and chat more informally. Um, uh, the reason for, for ending at 3.30 is really um, uh, I'm just worried you're going to get stuck in traffic jams on the way to, back to Bangkok. But if anybody um, does want to stay on after that and, um, and, and chat, they're very welcome to do so. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, I'd like to um, begin uh, with a few of general remarks um, about Buddhism or um, Theravada Buddhism, this particular school of Buddhism, and the one in which I've I've trained and um, which I've studied uh, to some extent. I'd like to um, start off uh, with a general classification of religions, that it seems to me um, we can distinguish between the religions that originated in the Middle East and those that originated in India. And the religions that originated in the Middle East, um, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, um, the, the uh, monotheistic religions um, can be classified as belief systems. They are religions in which faith plays the predominant part, predominant role. And that being the case, um, in the West um, we've tended to understand religion um, as to be primarily a matter of faith. And uh, in, indeed, these religions are often referred to as the great faiths. And um, that, that being so, there, there's often the tendency to um, apply that same standard uh, to the religions that grew up in India. I think it's that misapplication uh, which um, leads to a lot of uh, confusion or misunderstanding about the nature of Buddhism. The religions that uh, grew up in India, um, speaking most particularly here about Buddhism, um, are not belief systems. Um, I would characterize them as, or I would characterize Buddhism as an education system. So this is the first um, distinction I'd like to make here between religion as belief system and religion as education system. Um, if we try to um, look at Buddhism as a belief system and say, what do Buddhism, Buddhists believe in, or Buddhists believe in reincarnation, and Buddhists believe that the world is suffering, and all these kind of things, then we're already um, well on the way to a complete misunderstanding uh, of what Buddhism is all about. So the first step 
um, to understanding this is to consider it's a different kind of religion. Um, it's a different sort of religion, an education system. Now, um, what do I mean by an education system? And um, is there a role for faith um, in an education system? The, um, any, um, any endeavor in life, whether it's considered a secular or a religious endeavor, um, is dependent on taking on certain um, beliefs. Um, even uh, scientific research is based on certain beliefs about uh, our ability to um, understand the world through the means of the senses um, and certain implicit uh, beliefs about the nature of reality. Um, so it's a matter of making uh, those beliefs uh, conscious um, and understanding um, what belief is. So in Buddhism, we say it's an education system um, which um, incorporates faith um, or a certain kind of faith, um, but it's one that also insists on uh, including the nature of faith um, within um, the range of those things to be studied. The, the word for faith um, used in the ancient Buddhist scriptures is satā. And you'll find if you um, look in the, in the suttas, the teachings of the Buddha, that wherever this word occurs, it's always accompanied by the word banya, or faith, or excuse me, or wisdom, as it's usually translated, or discernment. As I say, it's, um, it's considered that any kind of belief um, which um, lacks that um, willingness to apply one's critical intelligence uh, to is, is not Buddhist faith. And in Buddhism we make a clear um, distinction between faith and knowledge. To say, um, faith um, applies when you haven't experienced something for yourself and you can choose to believe that it's true uh, or not. But uh, however strongly you believe in something, that belief is not knowledge, at least in, as um, Buddhism understands the word knowledge. Now often, um, if somebody believes in something very strongly, believes in it so strongly that they have no doubts at all, they tend to confuse that strong faith with knowledge. They say, I know. Um, and you say, what do you mean when you say, I know? You say, I believe. Um, and, and so we get this kind of circular reasoning that I believe because it's true, and it's true because I believe it. Um, and this is one of the basic um, <clears throat> foundations for a great deal of strife and conflict in the world because if you think that something is true because you have no doubts in it and you feel in your heart that it must be true, um, then you're inevitably going to have problems when you meet other people or other groups who have um, exactly the same intuitive certainty uh, about something um, which you have dismissed as false. And uh, a great deal of um, difficulties how you relate to somebody who um, is equally sure that they're right um, about something that you're sure is wrong. Um, classic responses to this dilemma are try to have nothing to do with those people and just mix with the people who have the same um, belief as you do and you can constantly reinforce um, your faith or um, you can try and perhaps force people who have a different belief to you to change their beliefs and adopt yours or perhaps you can try methods of persuasion of one kind and another. But whatever method you choose, 
um, when you confuse faith with knowledge, you're always going to have a problem with us and them. Um, and it's very difficult to transcend that, unless perhaps you, um, you answer it by saying, well, we both believe in the same things, we're just using different language, which is kind of the secular humanist um, way of, of dealing with this kind of problem. And Buddhism anyway says that um, believe whatever you, uh, you want to believe, but um, don't um, believe your belief to be knowledge. Be humble and realize that um, whatever you believe is not necessarily so. Mm. And um, if all the uh, the members of all the different religions in the world had that kind of humility, probably the world would be a, a lot better place to live in than it is right now. But uh, Buddhism says faith um, is important um, because it clarifies the mind, um, it enables you to make choices, a clear choice, and to follow a path clearly, um, and it gives you energy and effort. Um, if you look at faith as, um, as a means of believing that something has value, then whatever you believe has value or gives meaning to your life, then you're going to commit yourself to that actually quite strongly. So the Buddha, um, the word Buddha is a title and it's a title given to a human being uh, who realizes the supreme, the highest thing that a human being can realize, um, and he does so without a teacher. And the, the Buddha um, of our era was born 2,500 years ago in India, um, born into a princely family, and um, after six or seven years of, of struggle and experimentation, um, he realized um, we call Nibbana or enlightenment, uh, whatever you want to call that. Now the, the essence of that experience of enlightenment was that every kind of um, greed, um, every trace of anger, hatred, aversion, um, every delusion was completely dispelled, was completely um, ended. And in its place, um, his mind became filled with wisdom and compassion. Now, the, so the Buddhist faith that steps you off on this education process is um, there is such a thing as enlightenment. It's the highest thing that a human being can realize. Um, the Buddha realized it, and the teachings that he gave regarding um, the nature of the world, the mind, and the, the method by which other human beings can realize what he realized is valid, it's authentic, it works. This is the, uh, the kind of basic faith that um, a Buddhist needs. So there's no way that we can prove um, what happened 2,500 years ago in India. But there is um, an application to our lives in that uh, the Buddha made it very clear that he um, started off, he practiced, he realized as a human being and as a, we can say, as a representative of the human race and his enlightenment proved the capacity of human beings for enlightenment and thereby the capacity um, of all of us for enlightenment. So um, if you read in a book that it says a Buddhist uh, has faith in the Buddha's enlightenment, um, how that applies here and now is that it implies within it a belief in our own capacity for enlightenment. And the Buddha made very clear that that capacity for enlightenment 
um, is present both within men and women um, and a, a people of all races and, um, and backgrounds. So this is the, um, the, the faith that leads on to this educational process. Now, the education I'm talking about here means um, a training, um, a development, a cultivation of all aspects of our life. Um, our, the way we behave, um, the way we relate to um, the world we live in, the people around us. Um, it refers to a training of, of emotion um, and a training of our wisdom faculty and intelligence. So um, this all-round training, education, cultivation is um, referred to in a Pali word, pavana, pavana, which um, is usually translated into English as meditation. Um, and it's an, somewhat unfortunate that that translation has led to a very uh, reductionist or, or narrow understanding um, of what the Buddhist education process is. And this is meditation is a matter of um, sitting um, in a certain way with your eyes closed and um, concentrating on an object or, um, or doing various um, insight techniques um, or walking up and down and doing the same kind of thing. Um, certainly these are integral parts of Buddhist education, um, but they are not um, all of it by any means. And the, the Buddha is stressed that um, this education uh, cannot be carried on in one particular area of our lives while neglecting the other areas. Um, that it uh, has, the Buddhist teachings have to be applied um, in every part of our lives. So um, if we don't uh, give a lot of thought to how we relate to our family members, um, the people at work, people around us, the society in which we live in, um, then in our daily life we'll be fostering um, the very qualities um, that in formal meditation practice, the sitting and the walking, we're trying to eradicate. Um, so it, it's like walking um, one step forward and two steps backwards. So that's to me a harmony um, and an application to um, all parts of our, of our daily life. The, um, Uh, making my distinction a um, little time uh, at the beginning of the talk um, between uh, religion as a uh, belief system and education system, I think this can be seen uh, quite clearly um, the relation to morality. Now in the uh, theistic systems um, morality um, is considered to be um, laid down by um, the the deity, the supreme deity or God, um, for human beings to to follow and to obey, um, and there is um, reward and punishment involved. And um, because the mor morality is derived from God, then there is a question of intercession. There is a question of prayer and asking to be forgiven, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, in, in Buddhism, um, there is no uh, concept, conception that the Buddha um, laid down you know, what's right and what's wrong and rewards or punishes people. Um, the idea is that the Buddha is someone who understood the nature, um, human nature, the way things are, the way the world is, um, and taught the, um, the most skillful and intelligent way to live in the world in order to harmonize with those laws. And um, 
That being so, the the moral code um, is one which is based on um, human psychology um, and most particularly volition or intention. So the um, the training in morality is a training of volition. Now, generally speaking, uh, we're we're not very um, skilled in separating volition from action, um, especially under pressure um, when we don't really have time to think about things. We find we've all already acted and already spoken by the time we realize that that wasn't such a wise thing to do or wasn't in line with our principles or our ideals. And um, the Buddha's teaching of mindfulness and being awake and present to um, our actions um, seems reasonable, but it's extremely difficult to, to do. But the, one of the points about mindfulness is that you have to be mindful of something. Mindfulness needs a peg or pegs. Um, and that's why mindfulness is closely akin to memory. It's a certain kind of memory. Now, um, as far as morality is considered, the moral training, the training of conduct, of body and speech, um, the, the skillful means the Buddha gave us is to uh, voluntarily adopt um, certain standards um, of conduct and speech um, and to reflect on those um, often so that they become almost second nature to us. So that um, in the case that we might be um, tempted to um, hurt somebody or to speak harshly uh, or to do something dishonest, mm. then um, as we consider that action or as we're about to perform that action, then if we've uh, really given ourselves to this study and training, the memory, um, the mindfulness of a precept, of a standard, a training standard pops up into our mind that, that no, this is against the precept. Um, so it's not that um, uh, that there's someone going to punish us, we do, but there's this awareness, we become awake in that moment um, that what we're, do, what we're planning to do uh, conflicts with the standard that we have adopted. And if uh, you have an ability to be patient and just to bear with that impulse to act, then that impulse to act passes away. And it's at that moment that you have a moment of insight um, and you see that the that impulse is not who you really are, it's a passing impulse which is the product of certain causes and conditions and that you don't have to act upon it. And it's here where you, you drive a wedge in between volition and action that you first experience a sense of freedom um, and the ability to choose wisely. Mm. But as long as uh, you lack that kind of mindfulness and clear standards to be mindful of, um, then we're usually wise after the event. So uh, mindfulness uh, means um, the ability to apply your intelligence and wisdom at the moment when it's most needed, and the moment when there are, there's some conflict and some um, pressure upon you to, to act in an, an unskillful way. So the, um, the determining factor um, is volition. Now, um, certain acts uh, may seem to be reasonable uh, or to be permitted under certain circumstances, but the, uh, if one still has the volition to act, then the karma has been created. So 
let's say, a case of um, killing another human being. The worst um, uh, kind of kamma um, would be in the case of someone who plans a murder long in advance and determines to do it in the cruelest, most awful way. Um, whereas um, a much weaker uh, case might be uh, mercy killing, euthanasia, or a soldier who's been drafted into the army against his will and forced onto the battlefield and kills somebody else to save their own life. Um, but whatever the reasons might be, and however um, sympathetic one might be to them, the, um, the determining factor of whether kamma has been created or not is whether there has been the intention to kill and whether uh, that attention has been acted upon and is successful. So the intensity of the kamma is affected um, by the reasons, but not the production of kamma itself. So um, on the question of, of kamma, again, this is not something which is always um, so, so clear-cut. Um, one of the, or not so easily seen, Again, there is a certain um, necessity for faith or trust. Um, here, um, often uh, you hear people who, uh, you know, who who die a horrible death or have some um, uh, some bad experience, and they say, "Oh, it's because I did this when I was a child," or um, obviously um, that's just the result of that. But Kamma is, is far more complex than that and is very rarely um, so clearly seen as you steal something from them and then a few days later or a few years later someone steals something from you. Um, it's, it's far more complex than that and certain, um, certain aspects of the law of Kamma have to be taken on trust. Um, but they can also be um, verified in certain areas, as particularly um, the area in which you can verify uh, kamma, is that every time you act upon a particular impulse, then that action um, becomes more likely in the future. You create habits. Um, if, you've, if you've never done, let's say, a particular um, unwholesome, unkind act. If you've never done it before, um, and you 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 feel that it's it's wrong, shouldn't be done, then there is a certain taboo and a, a real resistance to to performing that action. But let's say that you um, lose your mindfulness or you're provoked, and then you do perform that act. Then you'll notice that to perform that act a second time is uh, much less difficult than the first time. And if you do it more than two or three times, it can become quite easy and could even become um, an habitual action. And this is a very good example of law of kamma, where we create grooves in the mind, in particular ways of action, because there is so much going on in our life, a lot of times we're acting on automatic pilot, um, and people often say, oh, I didn't really mean to do that, I'm sorry, I was just, I was tense or I was rushed or... But um, the reason why that should be the automatic response in that particular situation for you um, is because of your actions and speech um, in the past which have created that kind of furrow or that created that kind of rut in which your, your mind falls most easily. So... Um, the Buddha um, then stressed um, that kamma is created by volition and that morality um, to be strong and, uh, and a part of this Buddhist education um, is one which we need to be mindful of volition and we're mindful of volition by having precepts to be mindful of which illuminate volition as volition, as an impermanent mental phenomena arising according to causes and conditions. And it's not a philosophical concept, this is something that you can see quite clearly for yourself. But um, what is particular about Buddhist morality is that it's considered to be part of a training 
and that it is um, intimately connected with the other parts of the training. Now, if you act in unskillful ways and speak in unskillful ways, then uh, almost inevitably you're going to feel guilty about it afterwards. Um, if you don't feel guilty um, or <clears throat> you don't want to feel guilty, maybe you may justify it to yourself or you may kind of repress what you've done or make excuses for yourself. But um, there, is, there are traces left there. Now if you live a very uh, uh, busy, uh, superficial kind of life, a lot of distractions, a lot of things going on where you don't ever have to be with yourself um, very much, then um, you may not notice this so clearly um, whenever you feel um, uncomfortable with yourself then go and have something to eat, go and watch a movie, um, um, chat with someone on the telephone and uh, do something. Um, <clears throat> but if you uh, start to apply yourself to an inner cultivation, practice of meditation where you're willing to um, abandon distractions and to be completely present with yourself, with your own mind and body, um, then all the things that you, um, you can keep under the surface um, in your daily life become uh, very apparent to you. And often it can feel like you're actually going backwards when you start meditating. And you see a lot of anger and irritation and kinds of um, things can pop up into your mind and you think, I before I meditated I wasn't like this, I was a really nice person, I didn't get angry with people I, but uh, a lot of um, things that you've been holding down will just kind of bubble up to the surface um, but what you'll see particularly is that uh, you don't get away with anything, there's, there's nothing free and that if you, um, you can be sitting and meditating and everything's going quite well and you're quite mindful and suddenly um, up into your mind pops um, memory of something mean you did yesterday or something unkind you said to somebody um, and it can not just be yesterday, it can be a week ago, a month ago, years ago um, and it's as if we have a um, kind of a tape recorder or a, um, some kind of a device um, within our mind that as we become more clear and more relaxed then the memory of these things uh, comes up in our mind and it's here that um, we'll see just how important it is to be um, scrupulous, careful um, uh, with regards to how we act and how we speak. Um, it becomes very clear um, in meditation that um, no great inner peace um, can be realized um, unless one sorts out uh, the quality of one's actions and speech in daily life. Now the, the practice um, of meditation um, is one which includes, uh, I'm talking about um, in cultivation of the mind here, is, is one which um, includes various kinds of techniques. Um, but particularly I think in the West where we're where it's information oriented and we think that problems can be um, can be um, addressed, can be dealt with through more information um, that when we start to meditate we think if we get all the information, get all the tricks and the techniques and everything just down then we'll be successful. Um, and this is why meditation, um, I'm using this in a more kind of loose way here, um, is a very humbling uh, activity because it's not one that you can use willpower in the same, on in the same way. Willpower um, is um, something which is of use uh, for the practice or the training of body and speech, being self-disciplined, being able to refrain from things that you like, to defer gratification in certain cases. Um, but on the level of the mind, making a, a firm determination and, and gritting your teeth and getting down to it and um, it's not always that successful because the mind has to be in a, um, in a very relaxed, pliable um, kind of state 
and um, it's a skill and an art to to train the mind. Now, um, if you read books about Buddhist meditation, often the the wisdom um, side is um, emphasized. The vipassana side is is emphasized. And indeed, in in the states, a number of places in the West. Um, people refer, prefer to refer themselves to themselves as vipassana practitioners rather than Buddhists um, and as an identification with vipassana as kind of the heart of Buddhism, that which makes Buddhism unique um, and so on, and this idea that vipassana is something separate from and higher than um, techniques to concentrate the mind. But uh, an analogy here might be with uh, worldly kind of, uh, education and the distinction between IQ and EQ. Um, it's considered that uh, for success in, in education, uh, generally IQ accounts for about 20% and EQ 80%. And if you, um, uh, uh, perhaps we may consider it let me compare it to bullets. Let's say in a case that you're using a gun in a legitimate way, not to kill anybody. Um, and wisdom, intelligence is like uh, like bullets, but uh, EQ is like the gun. You can have lots of bullets and they can be very effective, but if you don't have a gun or your gun doesn't work, it's not going to um, it's not going to shoot anything. And if you have um, uh, knowledge and understanding of anything, but you lack the emotional maturity to um, make use of it, um, then uh, may well not be effective at all. And so in meditation there are two aspects. Um, there's the aspect which deals in the emotional level, and there's the aspect which deals with the intellectual or cognitive um, level. So. Um, certain um, meditation techniques emphasize that which is um, seeking the emotional benefits and emotional maturity, um, whereas the uh, so-called vipassana techniques are emphasizing the cognitive um, aspects. But these two are in reality um, uh, inseparable. Um, now, one of the values of um, uh, concentrating uh, the mind or being able to maintain awareness in the present moment um, is that uh, one, that you uh, develop an ability to dwell in the present moment um, without either um, falling into drowsiness or without um, being carried away with thoughts and fantasies and imagination. So the ability to dwell um, awake, aware, but without um, mental um, gossip proliferation um, uh, it means being able to dwell still um, am amongst things which are um, encouraging you to either like or dislike and to attach to or to reject. And for the wisdom faculty to, um, to really uh, achieve its aims of, of seeing the nature of reality as a direct experience, this is a most important precondition um, that the mind is still and clear uh, without uh, moving towards the pleasant and moving away from the unpleasant. And this is one of the, um, the abilities which is conferred by um, uh, steady mindfulness over a period of time which results in a stillness which we call samadhi. Now another um, aspect of this um, is that when the mind becomes still um, and calms down, um, it gives rise naturally to a sense of bliss um, and a very deep, um, uh, profound kind of happiness. 
And this um, is a wonderful discovery because we've all of us heard, I'm sure, since we were kids that true happiness lies within and uh, uh, you know, you, money doesn't, you know, doesn't solve all your problems and doesn't make you really happy and, and all those kinds of um, sayings and, and uh, we pay lip service to them perhaps um, but we don't really believe it because we've never experienced this inner bliss ourselves. Um, and we're of course wary of um, throwing away what um, happiness we do have apparently for something which we may never realize. Now the ability to access this inner peace, inner bliss, um, you can call that a, um, a samatha or an um, accomplishment of uh, concentration but it has um, great implications for the whole way we understand ourselves, we understand life, um, we, the way that we conduct ourselves. Um, for, for one thing, it gives us for the first time a perspective um, on the usual kinds of sources of pleasure that we have in our lives and gives us um, more willingness to weigh up the pros and cons. Um, and to um, just to see um, whether all of the kinds of pleasure that we experience in our life are really worth it. Um, but e even if we weigh them up and we consider that they are worth it, then um, we will at least not be drawn into acting in immoral or um, harmful ways um, through a desire for that happiness. Um, it's like if you've got um, uh, a huge amount of money in the bank even though you uh, may still say let's say you win the lottery and you have a huge amount of money you may well still decide that you still want to carry on working um, because you enjoy working um, even though you don't need the money anymore so you, even though you decide to carry on working and receiving a wage even though you might not strictly need it um, it's highly unlikely that you would um, be dishonest or try to cheat other people um, because there's no need um, and similarly when you have this kind of inner peace then inner happiness then there's no need to um, be um, acting in unskillful harmful ways um, out of this sense of inner lack and, and neediness um, so that uh, access to inner peace, inner happiness gives us this contentment uh, and gives us the ability to um, and the courage um, to look at our minds more and more clearly. Now one of the um, teachings for which Buddhism is very well known um, is that Buddhist, uh, Buddhism teaches that life is suffering. Um, again this is, is a rather um, inaccurate um, translation and understanding. Let's say first of all that the word dukkha um, covers um, uh, a very wide, a huge variety of um, experiences. Um, it can sometimes it's transfer it's translated as unsatisfactoriness. Um, can re uh, can also be uh, translated as lack. The sense that we lack something, no matter how. Um, pleasurable we find things and however well life is going there's always a sense that there's just something we don't quite know what missing it's not it's not quite right it's not it's not it yet and um, so the Buddha says that everything except for um, Nibbana is fundamentally insecure and fundamentally um, or in the last resort um, unsatisfactory that there is a deep yearning in the mind for enlightenment and that as long as the mind is unenlightened then it will never be totally free of that sense of lack. Now that sense of lack can, can vary from very subtle um, uh, perception to very coarse kinds of uh, physical mental suffering. But that whole spectrum of experience all non-enlightened experience is summed up under this one word of 
of dukkha. Uh, and it's for the comprehension and for the understanding of what dukkha means um, that this, this education um, is undertaken because it's through understanding dukkha that one is free from it. And this is a very basic principle of Buddhist teaching is that we only ever transcend something, we're only ever really free from something through thoroughly comprehending it, both intellectually, emotionally, and understanding it is a direct experience. Now, the first noble truth of dukkha. Now, this dukkha is, has a cause, has a cause of ignorance and craving, um, and it has an end. It doesn't have to be like this. And there is a path towards its end, this path of training of body, speech, and mind. Now, um, given that uh, the, the, the most important concept or word there is, is dukkha, um, it has led to this uh, understanding or, or perception of Buddhism looks on the world as, as suffering and is kind of pessimistic um, without taking into account, of course, Buddhism says, well, the whole point of religious life is to go beyond that. And it is possible, which is a much more optimistic view than is generally credited. But also, the, the Buddha taught very clearly that the only way that you can understand suffering and the only way that you can transcend suffering um, is when your mind is happy. Um, so this is a the path is a path of increasing happiness and the culmination of this path of happiness is the complete penetration of the nature of suffering. Um, so uh, meditation um, is um, a path of happiness. It's, it's, it's teaching you more intelligent, more sustainable ways of experiencing happiness. Everybody wants to be happy, but very few people are very um, systematic and intelligent about the way they, they look for happiness. Um, but the Buddha says that um, any kind of goodness, intelligent action uh, will lead to a sense of buoyant, inner buoyancy and uh, inner well-being. And if that inner well-being is cultivated further, it gives rise to bliss and happiness. And the happy mind becomes concentrated, and the concentrated mind sees things as they truly are. So the Buddha made very clear that um, happiness and pleasure, uh, when it's coming from blameless um, sources, um, is uh, not only to uh, uh, not to be a... Uh, uh, avoided, but it, it's it's something definitely to be cultivated. So the happy mind is a strong mind. If you can see this just generally, if you're in a happy frame of mind and somebody uh, comes to you with their problems, then you're very likely to be um, much more likely to be patient and to be able to listen to them well and to be able to help them however you can. And if yourself you're you're full of uh, inner worries and doubts and anxieties in you're so caught up in your own problems you have little time for anybody else's and the ability to stay with something and to be able to look at it clear, carefully and clearly means that the, the state of the mind and the emotional state of the mind is as important as the particular knowledge um, and information that you might have. So path of meditation is one uh, which uh, depends on mindfulness, ability to be clear, awake, bright here in the present moment and to uh, by that to experience or to investigate the nature of um, happiness and unhappiness and to be um, and to experience for yourself that the extent to which you can abandon um, unwholesome thoughts of greed, hatred and delusion is the extent to which you yourself um, experience um, inner peace and happiness and also you have that kind of resource to be able to help other people. So these are um, a few um, preliminary sort of reflections and, and thoughts about um, Buddhist teaching. Um, uh, given the time constraints, somewhat sketchy. But um, anyway, after 
we have our meditation session, then there will be time for anyone to ask any questions, um, either about what I've been talking about just now or um, anything else at all which you'd rather talk about. But um, right now I'd like to give everyone a, a break for five minutes or so if anybody wants to stretch their legs and um, uh, use the bathroom, whatever, and then uh, we'll come back in, say, at 20 past and we'll uh, have a meditation session. Right here.